Okay, welcome everybody. On behalf of IMEA, the State Department of Ed, and District 3, I would like to welcome you to today's virtual PD opportunity. Today's session is a guide to percussion pedagogy terminology that will be quickly implemented into your program to improve your students. Our presenter today is Rob Solens, and he will be sharing and demonstrating effective warm-ups and has requested that you have pads, sticks, mallets, and a soft pillow or blanket to have with you during the presentation. Rob is an experienced clinician, arranger, and teacher, and has worked with marching bands all over the country. Today's presentation will be recorded and can be viewed later on the IMEA YouTube channel, where you will be able to access all of these virtual PD opportunities. Rob has agreed to answer any questions you might have during the presentation, so if you need to see something again, please put your questions or comments in the chat and I will be monitoring them. I would like to thank Megan Olswanger and the leadership from District 3, IMEA, and the State Department of Ed for providing these opportunities. Please remember that we are trying to continue these presentations throughout the fall and are still looking for volunteers to present on their expertise. I will put my email in the chat and please reach out if you have something to share. Tune in next Thursday, September 17th at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time uh, for Arts and SEL with Kathy Stefani. And Tuesday, September 22nd with Jimmy Lawrence as he goes through tips and tricks for educators using Logic Pro. At this time, I would like to turn the time over to Rob Solens. Thank you so much, Rob, for being willing and able to demonstrate for us today. Um, I have put his uh, uh, link to his Dropbox um, materials in the chat. So if, if you want to click on that as we go through the presentation, um, please do so. OK, thank you so much. Cool. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and I thank you to Rebecca and Megan for uh, giving me this opportunity. So um, before I get started with demonstration, um, for those of you who are here, um, I have a little drop box of goodies, if you will, of a bunch of things that you could potentially use in your classroom. Um, I just going through it real quick um, in alphabetic order, if you're looking at the drop box, um, it starts with a, a band part assignment. Um, it's a Google Doc that I use. It's just a Google Sheet of um, what I would use and keep track of all my students um, in my program. So I would be, I teach, uh, was teaching on multiple campuses, six through 12, um, and obviously going from the fall to the winter and all the different kind of uh, ensemble pieces. So I use that sheet in order to be able to keep track of the kids. It allowed me to um, understand what they played before. So if I had a student that played snare drum on a piece, um, and somebody else hasn't, I would use that to keep track of it. So feel free to make a copy of that and uh, use it at your discretion. Um, the next thing that I had in here was just uh, the beginner's material list. Um, this is what I used uh, for the last um, like 10 years and has been updated uh, from since my time in Texas. Um, one thing that we did a little bit different going through the list is we actually had practice marimbas um, that we had a company that was nearby that we would um, lease a leasing option. Um, and that's kind of like down front of the list, but it gives you an idea of like what I would set a beginner up with um, in their first year and all the things that we managed to get to and from school. Basically they would bring everything to and from school except for the practice marimba and the wire music stand, everything else for the most part would travel with them. And we would be able to put everything in that wheeled duffel bag that's at the top of the list. Um, moving on, I created two um, clinic exercise programs that I'm gonna go over. One's for mallets, one's for snare drum. Um, I have a, a counting sheet that's called more eighth notes that um, is something that I would use in the beginner classes and um, I'll talk through that if I get time to ch chat through that, but I just thought I'd share like basically what sixth graders could do about halfway through the year. Um, and then I included a Google Doc of like what I'm gonna go over, or even if I don't quite get to everything, um, you'll be able to kind of go through that. There's a bunch of information that I think would be really helpful. And then the next thing was, if you have time when we're all done, this is just a little questionnaire um, for me to just, you know, things that I can improve on uh, or just uh, topics that you'd like to hear that you think would be helpful. 
Um, and then the last thing is I have a little speed note reading um, sheet that I used uh, at the beginning of the year with my beginner percussionist and can be used at any grade level to get students to recognize note names. Uh, and I'll talk about how I implement all these things. So with that being said, I'm going to jump in to my stuff. So um, at the very beginning, um, basically, I just wanted to, my, the, the idea like overview is I'm going to try to go over the basic um, setup, the grip versus snare and mallets. Um, I have foundations for a great snare drummer, foundations for a great mallet player. Um, and then I have like what I think are the most important exercises that you can use for all grade level levels. And then I'll talk a little about the troubleshooting things you might see in the percussion world. And then just some other philosophies and um, some other ideas. And then if you're interested in my help, if, uh, if you're so inclined, um, how you can get a hold of me and some things I have to offer. So um, one thing, uh, so the, the three big things that uh, I think are really key to a successful percussionist are their understanding of rhythms. If they understand the rhythms first, then you're well on your way for a successful percussionist. Then doing note names um, on the, reading it obviously on the staff, and then actually being able to do note recognition on the instrument that they're playing on, and then stroke types, which are the four basic strokes. Um, if your students have a firm understanding of those just real basic things, they'll be successful all the way through high school. Um, so uh, so that's, that's kind of in a nutshell what I'm gonna try to go over. Um, if you're looking at the Google Doc, I'm going to skip over the equipment setup. Um, I might talk through that a little bit, but I, uh, but I, what I really wanted to do is get into the grip. Um, and if we have people that really want to have information about the equipment setup, we, we can. But um, so I'm going to start with um, the snare drum grip. And one thing when I start uh, beginner percussionists in sixth grade, we start on snare drum. Um, getting their understanding of holding the stick correctly and having a good fundamental foundation of like how to move their wrist and applying and understanding how rebound works, I think is key uh, to their success. I know that I've talked to some directors up here and other places I've been where they start mouths first. I don't necessarily encourage that um, because I see a lot of issues with grip uh, develop because you're dealing with a smaller mallet um, and sometimes how they uh, end up holding the stick they end up with a really uh, pinched fulcrum here um, and their fingers are always off the stick so the whole beginning of the year they get really comfortable with just basically trying to get um, develop their target practice if you will striking the notes and then when it comes back to doing what they need to do with their fingers in order to play snare drum is kind of already ingrained in them and, and so yeah, so this is, that's kind of one of the main reasons why I start with snare drum. Um, so let's talk a little bit about grip and some of the stuff I'm sure many of you know, but I'm just gonna go over it real quick. Um, I teach my students all the different kind of gri grip types. So when I refer to it, I can tell them what they are doing and how they can fix it. So the first one I think everybody knows is um, French grip. So French grip is holding the sticks with the thumbs up and I'll try to use, I have two cameras, so I'll try to use them both. So thumbs up, um, basically just fingers are wrapped around the stick, okay? Uh, next one is German grip where the palms are completely flat to the ground, okay? Parallel to the ground. Um, and then the grip that I really try to enforce with all my students is American grip. So it's kind of a 45 degree angle. So again, if my thumbs are up and the sticks are parallel, then if I go to my German grip, which is completely flat, and then I have something that's just mildly in the middle. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how we can build that up and start from the very beginning um, and all the things I do with my students. So the first thing we have to understand is the balance point and how the stick actually works as a lever. Um, so in order to do this, the stick works if it's balanced in thirds. So one thing I have students do is I'll literally have them put their finger just inside the taper of the stick, like right here. So the stick tapers to here. Um, and what I'll do is put my other finger at the end and I just bring my fingers together and the stick will pretty much like balance itself as it moves to the center. So one third the distance, like if I split, split the stick into thirds, down here by the logo, 
Um, this is where we want our fulcrum to be built around. And this is the sweet spot for the stick and trying to figure out where the stick is going to naturally bounce as many times as it's on its own. Um, I see a number of students that choke back too far and the stick kind of just dies or they choke up too much. And the, the weight of the stick at the front doesn't actually fall to the pad. Um, on different sticks, um, I know specifically for Vic Firth, um, they'll have their logo here and then there'll be a little American flag, kind of something that looks like a Vic Firth flag actually. I usually tell students if they're playing with Vic Firth sticks to put their thumb right on that little flag. Uh, I am using an innovative percussion Keenan Wiley stick um, and it has the logo and then the signature and I don't know if you can see it, but it actually says USA right here. It just so happens that where that's printed, that's the sweet spot of the stick for this stick. Um, students knowing where to find that is really important. So um, that's going to be one thing that we talk about. So let's talk about building the grip. Um, I'm spending time talking about this because even with your beginners, your junior high students, your high school students, it always has to be reinforced. Uh, right now I'm helping out um, TJ Erickson over at Eagle High School. And um, two months ago when I came in, we kind of started from the ground up and rebuilt a lot of the grip with the students not because it wasn't good, it just could always be better. So what I do with my students is, if you're looking at your index finger, um, the first knuckle of the index finger right here where the finger creases, um, that is the, I, I usually tell students, look at your finger and I have them touch the different parts. I told them the tip of the finger, the pad of the finger, and then we have the joints of the finger. And then I do the same thing with the thumb, tip of the thumb, pad of the thumb. And I go through all these things because a lot of errors will, with the grip will come because of them putting different places, um, the stick in different places. So once they understand where that sweet spot is on the stick, I have them take the stick and right in the, the crease of that, my index finger, that first knuckle, I'm gonna place that USA that's on the stick right there. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my thumbprint and I'm going to put my thumbprint and point it towards the bead of the stick. Um, I see a number of students where the thumbprint points off to the side um, and that will immediately create issues. So thumbprint pointing down to the bead and then the other part of the stick is in that first knuckle. Um, so now I have something that kind of looks like this. So the next point is um, I basically just have students, they can close this if they basically hold their thumb here. So I'm trying to get rid of this gap right here. Um, you can do this by sliding your thumb forwards and backwards, or a lot of students will have their thumb slide off the stick here. So I make sure that that's there. And then basically we're just going to make all of our fingerprints touch the stick. Um, if the first thing I'll do with students at any level is if I can come up to the stick and pull it out, that's the appropriate amount of pressure. Um, I don't talk about I don't use words like hard or squeeze because any, all of that creates tension and we're trying to create um, as a relaxed grip as possible. Um, so when I talk about holding the stick, I talk about either holding an egg, like the, uh, as far as pressure, if we squeeze the egg too hard, we'll break it, um, or a baby bird. So like I wanna hold the baby bird in my hand, but I don't wanna drop it out um, and I don't wanna squeeze it so much that I'd suffocate it. So, Another thing I tell students to do is jiggle the stick. So I can have all my fingers on the stick and see that. And I can still jiggle the stick in my hand just a little bit. You can kind of see it move at the bottom. So once I get like one stick done, then I have them look at both their hands. As I compare the stick side by side and I make sure that the length of this stick out of the back of the stick is the same. Um, I will use my knuckle this part of my knuckle, it's pretty decent measurement for uh, any kid. And basically I'll tell them that there'll be about two knuckles from the back of the stick from where like the bottom of my palm is. Um, and that is another way to try to kind of give a, a good quick fix to that. So once we get to the point of where we have that, um, I will sometimes with some students mark a little dot where that USA is to say, put your thumbprint on the dot and make sure your thumbprint's pointed towards the bead of the stick. Um, so once we've gotten to that point um, and we have them matching their stick, um, basically what I do is there's usually a bunch of is issues that come up um, and I'll go through some of those. So drum set players, you can usually pick your drum set players out of a group like uh, just really quick. And I see this a lot at the high school level 
Um, high school players have a tendency to play French grip. Their thumbs are up, hi-hats over here, snare drums here, and in order for their hands to work, they turn their hands over because it's just, it's ergonomic, it works, and that's fine. However, when we're playing concert snare drum and we're playing timpani and stuff like that, turning their hands over a little bit more, especially for younger players, is gonna be a real benefit. So French grip, so that's why I tell them, turn your hands over um, when we're looking for that stuff. Um, stick angles is, um, I'm gonna get to how I set this up, but usually students have too narrow of a stick angle. So I call it slice of high, I'm sure many of you do too. This can be fixed by usually turning their hands over. It'll automatically open up that stick angle and slice of high. Uh, so, and French, uh, the thumbs coming up in more of a French grip is another reason why those angles are coming together. Um, when it comes to the fulcrum, a lot of students will take their thumb and slide it forward. Um, so now the fulcrum is between this finger and actually the base of their palm back here. So um, what I tell them to do is turn the, so turn the flashlight on, turn the flashlight off. The other one I do is if this is a mouth like a sock puppet, like, like they're talking, hello. Um, I basically just tell them to make sure that the mouth is closed. So I keep their mouth closed, okay? No, no air breathers and make sure that the flashlight is off. Um, so those are easy fixes for that. Uh, let's see. I see a lot of students that take the tip of their thumb and they put pressure here. And I just tell them to make sure that their whole thumbprint, it's like, like before phones changed, uh, you got in order to turn your phone or, or get your uh, password to work with your computers, you got to put that whole thumbprint on there. Um, so make sure that that's there. Um, let's see. Make sure that um, a lot of students usually because they put too much fulcrum pressure here, their back fingers come off the stick. Um, one thing that you can kind of try to do right now, and this is really important if, for those of you who are watching, is if you just take your hand and you just move it naturally, there's, it should move very relaxed. Both hands kind of move this way. So the moment that I take my thumb and index finger and just make them touch both hands, I should still be able to get that wrist, natural wrist motion to happen. The moment that I take my thumb and index finger and start to squeeze, so take your thumb and index finger and try squeezing there, and then now try to bend your wrist, this immediately causes tension in the arm. So this tension between the thumb and the index finger is where most issues come. So as you apply pressure here, which is where their fulcrum is, it's going to inhibit the, the wrist motion to happen. So that's why you end up with a lot of students using their arms when they play. It's because they're putting too much pressure between their thumb and index finger. Um, so that like, again, when they jiggle the stick, like it's really hard to, even if I, if I squeeze here, like the, I can't jiggle the stick even if my fingers are off the back of the stick. So if my fingers are on the stick and I have a relaxed fulcrum, I should still be able to jiggle the stick. And like I said, you should be able to just pull the stick right out. Like it, that, that is literally how much pressure it takes where my, my grip still looks good. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, the, the other thing that's really important about grip, and it doesn't seem like sometimes it's a big deal, but if the grip is incorrect, you can literally cause medical problems. Like t that's how tendonitis and exacerbating things like carpal tunnel syndrome, um, arthritis, all that kind of stuff can be because of too much pressure between the thumb and the index finger. So just make sure like, and I know that analogy is like used to death, but it's great, bounce the basketball. You gotta bounce the ball, okay? So we don't bounce the ball with the side of our hand. We bounce the ball with our hand here. And even if you bounce the ball, it's usually with your arm and a little bit of wrist. So the, um, the bounce the basketball thing is, in, is we'll teach kids to keep everything nice and relaxed. Uh, let's see, I'm reading my notes. Um, oh, so another part of the setup too, uh, and I'll get to like how we're doing some of the setup is most kids, I didn't realize this for the longest time is I had students that would get really close to the pad then they would play. So they'd go to set up and everything looks good. I got a good angle, my sticks are in the right place, they turn their hands up, everything looks good. The problem is my elbows are literally about six inches behind me and this is causing all kinds of tension in my upper back. So in order to get our setup to happen, we can either A, start with our hands by our side and we can say our grip's all good and then we just bring our hands up. My elbows should stay by my side as I go here to bring my sticks up. 
And that, that's gonna keep tension to a minimum. So now the reason why I'm turned sideways under this is you can see it, but now my elbows are in the right place. So now I what I usually tell students is, here's my setup. Now walk up to the pad until the beads are in the center. They should not have had to move their arms at all. So if you notice like now they're in the center, if I turn to the side, my elbows are still by my side. So this is going to fix a lot of problems. And as you'll start to get to see where you can tell kids to back up or move closer. The other option is obviously is if they're too far away, arms are extended, and we end up with that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing that you can do is, I, I just learned this this week from a good friend of mine, but you can have kids start with the stick, like pointing the stick straight out and they're parallel to the ground. And basically if you just take your elbows until they're by your side, this is going to kind of set up another way of relaxed grip. So like if I just walk up here, I'm in the center of the pad, life is good, elbows in the right, correct place. Um, so those are some quick fixes with that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I, I talked about squeezing too much here and the fingers coming off the stick. Um, when it comes to um, the keyboard, I'm just gonna talk about this real quick is, Sometimes we end up um, pinching from the fulcrum and the, or excuse me, the wrist ends up below the keyboard. So we wanna make sure that the angle that we have here um, is parallel to the ground, where in the case of the snare drum, we're gonna have a slight incline that's happening with the sticks so we can uh, avoid the rim. Um, let's see, last couple things. Oh, if the, if the sticks are too low, your, stu your students are getting lots of rim shots. It usually means that they're turning, they're moving their arm down slightly by like maybe a quarter of an inch. And the difference between here and here is the difference between getting a normal sound and getting rim shots. So if you end up with, so what that means is the height of the pad is probably not set up correctly. Um, so you might need to lower that pad by an inch. Uh, let's see. Last one was uh, when students play, another problem happens, I call it the Statue of Liberty. So I start with my sticks up and go with this, but this stick will start to drift upwards while this one's playing. So I tell the students no Statue of Liberty. So it just basically means that they're bending their elbow up. So they have to really pay attention to keeping their wrists low to the pad while they're playing. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll have them point their stick at their wrist and when they rotate that wrist up, we want to make sure that that wrist doesn't go down or up as they rotate up. I see other students that what they'll do is they'll push their arm down. So even though the stick angle looks correct, their hands are too low to the pad. So point here, rotate from that point, and then that should stay there while they're playing. Okay. Um, so let's talk about like some quick fixes in terminology because that's a lot of stuff. So the quick, quick fixes that I use uh, for my students that fix stuff that any band director can use all the way from the front of the band room is first one's quarters. So when the students have the grip right, so we have um, the thumbs in the right place, and we're just gonna say that we're here, usually what you'll see are thumbs up. So I say quarters. I should be able to put a quarter on the back of your hand and it shouldn't fall onto the ground. So usually if that, they'll know real quick, American grip, they'll rotate their hands to the correct position. Just make sure they don't over rotate because then they'll end up with some other weird um, technique issues. Mouths closed, fit flashlight off. So we want to make sure that that thumb, thumb is in the right place, both up and down and forwards and backwards. This is really common. So mouths closed, flashlight off, uh, big slice of pie. So the stick angle isn't 90 degrees, it's about 80 degrees, okay? Um, so if I tell kids big slice of pie, that's the kind of quick fix. Um, the next one is bunny slopes. So bunny slopes is, if, if, if this was flat ground, I want to be on the really introductory slopes for um, skiing. So I want it just enough that the marble can very slowly roll down the stick, okay? So we don't want it to stay in one place and we certainly don't want it to go towards you for our set position or our ready position. So I just want it to very slowly go that way. The other one is you can kind of put one index finger underneath the stick and that will give you the appropriate stick angle. It, it needs to be low to the rim. Um, let's see, what are the other ones? Um, oh, I say no black diamonds, so if kids overcompensate, so no falling off of cliffs. Um, so bunny slopes, uh, let's see. And then elbows by side, that's an easy one. And then holding the baby bird, holding an egg, so we have relaxed hands. 
Okay, so if we get to that point of where we have our setup, our hands are good, thumbs, index fingers, wrap the fingers around, we start with our hands by our side, our elbows are by our side, we bring the sticks up into the center of the pad. So from here, I'm checking all these other things that we just went over, I'm telling them quarters, bunny slopes, all that kind of fun stuff. And then the next thing that I want to do is I start in the up position when I teach students. Even if I have experienced students, I'll start here. I'll tell them to put their sticks on the pad or the drum. I'll make the beads touch. And then I'm checking to make sure everything looks good. Then I say barely pick their sticks up, barely pull the beads apart. And then from that point, I'm going to go to set position. So here's the trick with this. I see lots of rotation issues with kids when they play. So a rotation issue is like what I call a slice. So if you're looking at this camera over here, the stick should travel up and down in a straight line. A lot of students have a slice where the stick comes in the side like this. So we're not getting the best quality of sound because they're either turning their hand over or they're rotating for their forearm and they end up with this like curved stick path. So if you have another stick, this is gonna be difficult to see because it's in the line. But if I take this stick and I tr I'm gonna trace the path of the stick straight up. By doing this, this shows me that my stick is moving up and I'm bending my wrist the correct way. Instead of turning my hand over, so we're just gonna trace the line straight up and we're using wrist only. So I can even point my finger here, make sure I'm drawing that line straight up. And now I now have the most efficient path to and from the, to the path. Now, when I do this, and I did this wrong for a long time, is I used to have my students set up and be like, it should be a V when the sticks are up. That is incorrect. So in order for this stick to go up in a straight line, the stick actually travels towards my shoulder. And then the other stick should do the same thing. So I do one stick at a time, right stick turn, left stick turn, okay? And now my sticks are in, the, in a playing position and I call this set. So even uh, when I'm doing stuff for a program for the first time, I was doing this with all the Eagle High School students, I would go through this process like every single day over and over and over again to help rebuild their, their, their stance, to help rebuild their grip, and then them and reprogram where they thought that uh, path was going to start from. So the reason why I start in the up position is because it eliminates a lot of um, more complicated uh, issues. And the complicated issues are, unlike wind instruments, you obviously have to breathe in in order to play your instrument because it's a wind instrument. In percussion, we don't have to do that. So we can start with a stick here, and the first direction that it needs to go is down to the pad. So by starting in the up position, I can also see the dynamic that they're about to play. I can see if their hands are in the correct position, it's their attention. So I can, I'm able to see whether or not they're paying attention just before they even strike the pad. Then when I start playing, I wanna make sure that they're going down to the pad first. So if you have that student that always overplays everything, you can have them set up at their mezzo forte dynamic and you say, okay, play for me. And if they go like this first, you already know that the dynamic's going to be incorrect. So we start with everything in the up position, both in snare drum and mallets at the beginning. Um, otherwise, you have to teach them a prep stroke. Uh, and it's just a lot of information for kids to subdivide, get a smooth prep if they don't even understand how to move the stick yet. So I work that in after they have a good foundation of everything that's going on. Okay, uh, let's see. We're going to skip on. Let's see, grip, we talked about that, so it's high. Um, I'm going to jump over just real quick to mallet grip and then I'll, I might get to, to some exercises. So I teach the mallet grip different than the snare drum grip. And the reason for this is because um, we have to use the weight of the mallet. Sorry, I keep moving things up too high. I, using the weight of the mallet to produce sound, okay? There's, you have to generate your own rebound stroke in the land of mallet play. So, if I start here, or it, so to be clear, there's no rebound, so the mouth just falls. So instead of having my grip start here, like with a, a I can, well, it's called a front fulcrum, I actually start with gripping the mallet, and I have one inch, so I use my knuckle again like I did, one inch sticking from the back of my hand, and I'm starting with my back three fingers on the mallet, okay? So I, I call the kid, to the kids, I say, we're gonna do water pistols, and then we're gonna add our thumb and I'm gonna take the mallet and split the
the mallet with my thumbprint. And then basically I'm just bringing my index finger around. Now, if you notice, there's a slight notch that's right there, but by moving my fulcrum to, my fulcrum's actually my wrist now because nothing here is actually like really pivoting. So I'm now, because I've moved the fulcrum back, I'm using more of the, I'm using leverage to my advantage to create volume. So a lot of students, younger students, learn a snare drum grip on mallets. They pinch really hard here, they play on a bell kit with little tiny mallets, and it's really loud on their ears, and they play everything like this. So they haven't developed, uh, this is a, another reason why when you finally move students from beginner percussion over to marimba and vibraphone and timpani, like you can't hear them because they haven't developed the muscle strength to be able to play um, what they're doing. So at least if the, the leverage is back here and we add our thumb and index finger, um, we're going to create a lot more volume just because we've moved our, our lever back. Um, so that's really helpful. The other thing I tell students is um, that the mallet is, is parallel to the ground. So unlike snare drum, we have this stick angle. You can kind of see is here, the mallet's up. The, the sweet spot of the mallet is the, most, the furthest distance out. So if I increase that mallet angle up, I'm now playing with this outside portion of the mallet and I'm going to get a thinner sound. So I want to keep my hand parallel to the ground. Now the problem is when you say parallel, all the kids are going to do this parallel and they're going to try to make them parallel to the notes. So realize there's still your snare drum V, okay? You still have that 80 degree angle. But, and I show them, I'm like, not, this is parallel. So I have them push mouths all the way down, pull them up. And I said, make the mouths parallel. And then we'll do the same thing. We'll start over our notes, we'll rotate up, rotate up. And now we're here and I can see the volume that you're gonna play. So that, that's the difference that I do with the, um, with the grip and the mallets. And I strongly encourage that. Um, otherwise, that's, a, that's another reason why I start with snare drum is because the idea of starting with the stick is you have to use that lever. And the only way the stick will bounce is if you're using your wrist. Um, so that kind of goes to that. Let's see. I'm kind of skipping through some stuff. Mallet stance. Um, I'll come back. Well, I'll come back to the mallet stance, but I want to get into some snare drum foundation. Okay, so foundations of a great snare drummer. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how we can actually apply things to make you or your students better at bouncing the stick. Okay. Um, so why doesn't uh, a rebound stroke happen? And what I mean by a rebound stroke is I want the stick, if I throw it or drop it into the pad, I want the stick as naturally as possible to bounce back up. Okay. So this usually happens um, because there's too much pressure in the fulcrum or the wrist turn does not happen in an upward fashion fast enough after the stick hits the pad. So I can't say this enough, pressure is bad, okay? You, like don't use the word uh, like hit it harder, um, you gotta squeeze the stick or things like that. Those things are gonna inhibit their, their uh, ability to rebound the stick. So we've gotta use gravity to our advantage. Um, let's see. So uh, let's see. Let's talk. So we talked about baby birds and all of our setups. So um, something I, I've had students do in order to them to understand pressure, just to get it um, understood, is I'll tell, I'll tell them to squeeze the stick as hard as they can. And we're going to call that a 10. So squeeze, and then we're going to make it a 1. So 1 is like it's going to fall at like 0 is dropping the stick on the ground. So a 1 would be just right before the stick is going to start sliding. And realistically, for them, like you might want to tell them that their hand has to be at a one while they're playing, but realistically it's probably going to be at like a four or a five. Um, so we can kind of start there. So now the next thing is, is like, how do we get the sticks to bounce? So again, going back to our bouncing the ball, not squeezing from our fulcrum between our thumb and index finger, we're going to keep all of that relaxed. Okay. So let's talk about, let's assume that you started the kids and you're trying to just get the single stroke app in like out of time. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a way to build this up in a way of like your kids that are just like squeezing the stick and everything stops down. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our thumb and index finger like we set up and we're gonna take all of our finger, this is like one of the only times that you're gonna let kids take their fig fingers off the stick. So all the fingers off the stick and we're gonna move that stick in this line straight up and we're gonna flip it all the way back. 
So now all I'm holding on is the thumb and the index finger. So all I'm gonna do is rotate my hand enough that the stick is going to fall to the pad. And if, they, and if you drop it, it won't actually come all the way back. So if I just use, again, I use the basketball analogy all the time. So I'm taking the basketball and I'm just turning it over. I'm not throwing it to the ground. So by taking this, I'm turning it over. Like I'm not doing anything with my hands or anything to like actually get it to bounce. Because as everybody knows, and the kids will say this, will the, ba the ball bounce back up to my hand if I just turn it over? The answer is no. So you have to give it a little bit of a push. You don't have to squeeze the ball. It just, all you have to do is push the ball down and the ball will come back on your hand and your goal is to just put your hand underneath of it and scoop it back up. So if I take this idea with my wrist and my fingers, all I'm going to do is give it a little push and try to get it to come back up. Now, you'll see a number of reasons on why this doesn't happen. So a lot of students will do this. So the stick you can see that wants to bounce up, but the reason why it doesn't is because my wrist is inhibiting the motion. So as soon as the stick hits the pad, I have to pull my wrist up to get out of the way. Like I'm not doing anything with pressure with my thumb and index finger, I just pull the wrist back. So a little bit of a toss down, get the wrist out of the way. And you can do this, I would strongly encourage individual kids to try this on their own and just see if they can get the stick to come all the way back up. Now again, the stick should travel in a straight path, even if I'm doing this whole like no fingers on the stick. Okay. Once they get good at this, and you can see that the stick isn't doing this, you can see down here, this little like, they, what they'll do is this, they'll get there and then they pick the stick up. So that is what I would call a downstroke. So the stick stops down for a second and then they pick it up. It has to happen all in one motion. Okay. Once I see students do that, all I'm going to have them do is add one finger, add their middle finger to the stick and it's just going to touch the stick. Do the same thing. Again, pulling the wrist out of the way. There is zero pressure in my grip. Like it can pretty much fall out, okay? So when I'm doing this, you, I have to constantly talk about, I use the term soft hands. Soft hands is something that kids will understand. Um, it's also terminology I got out of the Eddie Green book when he talks about using adjectives that are appropriate for kids of a certain age group. So soft hands. Once I get this done, Add your ring finger, should be the same thing happening. And again, I'm using just my wrist. And then finally, I'm adding my pinky to just touch. At this point, they should still be like very relaxed with the grip and the stick should be able to bounce all the way up. All my fingers are touching the stick. Everybody can see that, okay? All the fingers are touching the stick. So even when I'm here, at no point do my fingers ever come off the stick. Okay. That's how we build our rebound. So eventually you get to the point of where you can do this uh, at a tempo. This is 80 beats per minute. And sometimes I'll literally have students go, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we'll take it really slow that they can do that. If the stick can bounce up to a full stroke, which is what this is called, as it gets faster, it, they should not have to apply any pressure to the stick to allow the stick to bounce. They're using gravity and I'm just turning my wrist. You can see my fingers. My fingers are constantly on the stick. Um, some students will try to use their fingers to pull the stick. That's not what's actually happening. There is a time to do that, but that is not this time. Um, and usually they try to go to that motion first and we have to build that later. Okay, so once we have all that applied, um, we're trying to keep the distance of the fingers this away from the stick the same. So we're not trying to, um, this makes things more difficult, has more room for error. So fingers should basically, once they set their grip up like this, the fingers should stay the same. If they have to open it up a little bit to be a little bit more relaxed, then so be it. Uh, let's see. If, I, if anybody has questions, type away, because I'm just going to cram as much information as I can and all this as I can. Okay. Um, remember always having them squeeze and relax or jiggling the stick. If I see students that are downstroking, I'll have them hold those sticks up, say jiggle the stick and they usually just give it a little jiggle. And then we go back through and I say, keep their hands with that kind of relaxed sensation. Uh, let's see next. Okay. So that would get us to at least how we can develop um, that full relaxed stroke. 
um, when we're doing this. So give me one second. Okay, so let's talk about real quick um, what's good, the foundations of a great tile player. I'm excited to talk about this because I see it happen so infrequently, which is teaching mallet students how to shift on the instrument. Um, so in percussion, we talk a lot about X and Y axes. axes. Um, so X axis is obviously what we're relying on, relying on for volume. Um, so that's our X axis. We must have a strong X axis before we can do anything forwards and backwards. This is another reason why I start on snare drum because if you're worried about target practice, this whole X axis is gonna go out the window. So you have to build a strong X axis before you can develop a strong Y axis. And Y axis is forwards and side to side. So if you're at high school and you're doing a marching band thing, tenor players, the reason why they can't play really well is because they can't play it on one drum. Same thing with mallet players. If you can't play good fundamental rhythms uh, on one note, there's no way they can move around the instrument. And most of the rhythmic errors happen on students is because they're trying to get the song to sound pitch wise the way that they want to, instead of rhythmically accurate first. So this is what I do to teach beginners and even high school students. Um, so I teach a chromatic scale first. Um, so real quick, when we're teaching the keyboard, I'm gonna go through this fast. So I have an octave, so I wanna teach the kids the note names real quick. So I start with D actually is the first note because this is our doghouse. So D for doghouse, that has the roof, it's the two smaller notes, D. Um, and uh, so the left of that is C for cat. So we have a cat, a dog, and then we live in a weird neighborhood. It's an elephant. So we have C, D, E. The next thing we move into the bigger house. We have a bigger roof and we start with the front door, uh, the garage. I use apple for what we eat. And then we have the back door. And then we repeat the neighborhood over and over again. So we have cat, dog, elephant, front door, garage, apple, back door, cat, dog, elephant, and I make the student, so what I'll do is I'll tell students, all right, everybody find a cat. And they touch a cat. And then I say, find uh, your neighbor's cat. And they go next one over, find your other neighbor's cat. So they can do that. And I just kind of name all that stuff to so make a little fun game and try to make them do it as fast as possible. So that'll be like cat, apple, front door, garage, and like have them touch. So once we get really good at that, we'll do, um, I should have included, there's a, there's a worksheet called Masters of the Alphabet. And it's being able to say your note names forwards and backwards. And I would do this before we even like get to the issue. So being able to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, G, F, E, D, C, D, A. And then do the same thing with B, C. Most students have problems because, um, wasn't that phone call? Um, most students have uh, problems because they can't say their alphabet forwards and backwards. So practice that a lot. Um, so once they can figure out all the white notes, we immediately start, I immediately start teaching them the chromatic scale and we talk about sharps and flats. So what I do is we teach the chromatic scale and they have to go C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, all the way up. And then they have to immediately do it backwards, do the flat C, B, B flat, A, A flat, G, all the way down. So once they've learned all that and they can demonstrate that for me, um, then I teach them an exercise to get to the shifting part. So um, we have our grip, water pistols, thumbs, index fingers. Um, one thing when you're setting up is you want to make sure you're in the center of your playing area. So I'm going to do a C chromatic scale. So they have to find the lowest note and the highest note in that playing area. And then their belly button is going to be at the middle note. In this case, it's F sharp. Once that's there, I'm going to start with my right hand over C, parallel to the notes, left hand over C sharp. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do four times on each note. C, 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 C sharp, C sharp, C sharp, C sharp, D, 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 D sharp, D sharp, D sharp, D sharp. But the most important thing is the shift. So preparing the mallet for the next note it's going to play on the con same consecutive hand, it will solve all your students' problems for note accuracy. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'll use my finger so you can hear me. So I'm going to go C, 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 C shift. My hand is going to go up and over to the next note, which is D, and it's going to hang out there. I'm going to use the mouse just so you can get. So I'm going to say C, 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 C shift, C sharp, C sharp, C sharp, C sharp shift, D, 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 D shift, D sharp, D sharp, D sharp, D sharp shift. So right here, not only are my mallets moving 
up to the correct volume, but they're also going to the next note. So I'm always thinking ahead. I can't stress enough about going slow enough so your kids can think about lots and lots of things. So when I get to this note where I have right hand on E, left hand on D sharp, so I'm going D sharp, D sharp, D sharp, D sharp shift. So what happens right here is, and this is where students start doing uh, kind of weird things, is they stack the mallets. They try to make their hands go beside each other. I don't do that. And here's why. So if we do this, and they can see this happen in slow motion. So I have to play E next after my D sharp. So I'm actually gonna bring my mallet. So it's not quite, I'm not gonna put it over F because that's the next thing. But after I play E, 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 E shift, my right hand is gonna go from E over to F sharp. And now during that time, my left hand can now move over to F in that motion. So again, E, 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 E shift. until I get to the end. When I get to my B flat, it's gonna go B flat, B, or excuse me, A sharp, A sharp, A sharp, A sharp shift, B, 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 B. There's no shift there because it's gonna play it again in a second. Then I come back down, but now I'm gonna say flat. C, 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 C shift, B, 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 B shift, B flat, B flat, B flat, B flat shift, A, 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 A shift, A flat, B flat, and I'll go all the way back down and then my hands have to shift again. So we can do this, well, I will do this really slow so they can say the note name and do the shift correctly. And the most important part of the shift is when you're, is right here, when you're going from your D sharp, E, F, F sharp. I will make them do this on any piece of music, but this one little exercise teaches them all of their note names, flats and sharps, all their inner, inner harmonics, um, it teaches them shifting, it teaches them dynamics, it teaches them quality of sound, and, it, and it's very simple and slow, and I will do this like almost every single day. So even before they start playing, I'll, we'll, it'll make it fun, and I'll see how fast they can go and go C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, and go all the way forwards and backwards, have individuals do it and see how that works. You can change the numbers on this. So instead of doing four, you can do three. You can do four up, three down, two up, one down. You can make it so that it alternates. But you should see the kids shifting to the next note. And if they're not shifting, it's almost guaranteed that they're going to make a mistake. Um, also making sure that they're reaching out to the center of the resonator. A lot of students, um, if you haven't played on mouths a lot, when I look down at the resonator, it looks like my mallet's over the resonator right there. Perception is everything. That is actual the center. This is uh, halfway between the notes. So students reaching out far enough is usually, not reaching out far enough is usually a big issue. Uh, let's see. So chromatic scale, flats and sharps, uh, open. I'm not doing this stuff. Let's see. Um, oh, so something that's really important about um, just percussion in general, and this is where I'm gonna get to my general percussion exercises. So the single most important thing that percussion students learn is a consistent motion of the stick. Um, I, I call it consistency of stroke, but there's a number of students that I see all the time that make mistakes um, rhythmically, not because they don't understand the rhythm, but it's because they're not allowing the stick to move in a consistent motion. Um, so I'm gonna go talk through a couple things. So all music skills are based on coordination. Um, I think sometimes we as music educators, we seek out the, the, the most coordinated students. Um, I, I, I agree with that to a certain extent, um, but I also believe that coordination is a learned skill. We've all done the pat the stomach, rub the head, or vice versa, and we all couldn't do it at the beginning, but we learned how to do it. It's a coordination skill. Percussion is a coordination skill. We start with coordination between two hands. All things music are coordination. If you can't get your trumpet fingerings right and move your fingers and tap your foot, that's a coordination exercise. Putting the button down and getting your tongue to line up with your fingers and your foot tap is a coordination exercise. In percussion, we have four limbs, so it's usually one rhythm, another rhythm, another rhythm in this foot, and another rhythm in that foot. 
So it's a bit, if you, if you think of percussion as the development of coordination, you will look at, I think you'll look at it a lot differently because I did, um, because I didn't believe when I started playing drum set when I was young, I thought that I wasn't a very coordinated person when it just came to the reality is I didn't have enough reps to become more coordinated. Um, if you've ever watched a baby crawl, like it's just l limbs flailing everywhere until the brain rewires itself to make like this foot and this leg move forward at the same time and the other way. It's why when we walk, our hands balance ourselves. So everything that we learn is a coordination exercise. Um, so we have to develop coordination. Um, in, in our students. The next teacher students rhythms, not roles. And what I mean by roles is I, I, I've every band room I've ever walked into my entire life has a poor marimba player sitting in the back of the room and we're doing our F Remington. Meandering back and forth between notes. Everything that a percussionist is going to play is going to be based on a rhythm. So even if they're playing a role, if I'm going to play a snare drum role, I'm still moving my hands in a rhythm. So if I don't understand how to go 1E e and a 2E e and a 3E e and a 4E e and a 1, it doesn't matter if I have the best buzzes in the world, I have to be able to go 1E e and a 2E e and a 3E e and a 4E e and a 1. Same thing with mallet rolls. When you play your mallets, if you're, if, let's say you're doing your F Remington exercise, I would make the F Remington, which is, let's say it's whole note, whole note, whole note. And let's say we're doing it at a glorious 90 beats per minute. So instead of just going roll, three, four, roll, and kids don't know when to move the mallets at the right time, and it's always late and mushy. Change it into 16, you can make it. I can apply all the information. I can think about my grip. I can think about playing in the center of the notes. I can think about shifting. I can think about all these things. And I've taken something that was just like meh, playing on one note. And if they're better at, if they can do better than quarter notes, I have eight notes. And I would encourage percussion students to put a release on it instead of usually like an air release like wind players do. And then more importantly, if they're get, getting good at that, have them play 16th notes. So right now you're like, well, that sounds like a rhythm. I would never have them do that in a musical piece. You are correct, because I would probably use a different rhythm. If I was playing this at somewhere around, let's say 80 beats per minute, I'm gonna have to teach my students a different rhythm, which would be 16th note triplets. That now sounds more like a role, and you're ingraining a rhythm that they need to understand and can apply to music. So when, if you were playing a piece of music that's somewhere around 80 beats per minute for your beginning band or maybe like one of your lower bands, you can actually turn all of those role rhythms into very specific achievable um, rhythms. Um, that being said, your percussion student should pretty much be at least one or two steps in front of rhythmically in front of the entire rest of the band. Um, so even if they are only playing music like this, they should understand how to go one E and a two E and a three E and a four and a one and a two E and three and four. So that when they see music on the page, they're trying to worry more about note recognition and targets, not going what rhythm is that. Um, so something to think about. Uh, teach of um, training students during the fundamentals on um, how to to play all these really basic exercises. So uh, I know I'm running out of time, but I'm actually get to some of these exercises. I did tell them I might, I would be willing to come back for another time to go through this stuff. Okay. So let's talk about eight on a hand. This is like the bread and butter of every percussionist everywhere, except I'm gonna make it a little bit more interesting. So we're assuming we have a good rebound stroke. Um, and we've gone through all of our setup stuff. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to start. So I'm going to do eight on a hand. And this is in the Dropbox file that I gave you uh, that's in there. It's the clinic snare drum A tube. So if you look at that. So I'm going to walk you through this first exercise. You can make this as short or as long as you want. I've given you my beginner super long version. So the first thing is before we even play the exercise is we've got to find dynamics. I try to build dynamics into my exercises as quick as possible because um, this allows us to get to stroke types. So the first thing we're going to do is find 12 inches. So I define 12 inches as a full wrist turn all the way up. And I know some of you are already like, there is no way in the world I would ever let my snare drummer play 12 inches uh, in the back of my band. And you are correct, I wouldn't either. However, getting them developing a range of motion is really important. So we're gonna call this 12 inches. So you're asking yourself, Rob, how in the world do we find all these other, dy other dynamics? And I don't feel like trying to get a ruler out for all my kids. I agree. So here's some tricks. Rotate the right stick all the way up. So I'm going from the bead, the other stick's flat on the pad. We're going to find halfway between the bead of my right hand and the flat distance. So my left hand's now at six inches, so I wanna find nine. So we're gonna split the distance between here. We're gonna call that nine. I have now found forte. So I go from fortissimo, and I'll make kids do this a bunch until they can find it, and I can stand on the other side. So 12 inches, six inches, halfway down, nine inches, okay? I literally just learned this this week and I thought it was an awesome, uh, another way to look at it. Nine inches is also a 45 degree angle from the pad. So from here to here is roughly nine inches, okay? So when students are playing, the mistake they make is they either look at the stick or they stare at you. They should be looking at the bead of the sticks in between right here. So if I'm playing my first eight on a hand, I'm literally staring in between to making sure that my right hand and left hand are coming up to the same height. So I have a reference point to compare this to and make sure it's coming up to the same height. And now I have another reference point over here. Okay, and now, and then I can go down and go down to my nine inches. So as I'm doing this, I do eight on each hand. So fortissimo, I make them tell me the dynamic and the height. So when I get ready to play, after my right hand finishes, I'm gonna play my left hand and I'm gonna set my right hand at forte now. Now I'm gonna play nine inches. Now I have time to bring this down, compare these two nine inches. So I'm gonna do that. Then the next thing is I've gotta find six inches. So we had our 12 and we found halfway. I just looked this up today because I was curious. Uh, I, my cell phone's using as a video. A average iPhone is six inches high. So is a dollar bill. So I'll go around, this definitely grabs the attention of your percussionists, especially if you can use a larger bill, always keeps them entertained. So that's six inches. So I'll go around, if I have to tape it to the side, but usually it'll sit there. So then I have kids bring their rotate up here, six inches. So it's the bottom of the bead to the top of the surface. Now the reason why I spend all this time doing this is so that I'm not screaming at kids or having band directors scream at kids about they're not playing soft enough. My students, we do this every day. And when I ask them to move all the way down to those lower dynamic levels, it's barely audible. So six inches, three inches, mezzo piano, inch and a half, piano, three quarters of an inch, uh, pianissimo. Or I just have them play at their kind of set position. So here I call pianissimo. And I have them literally, I'd say, play as soft as you can. We'll go all the way through that, and then we'll build it all the way back up. And they should be doing a rebound stroke through that whole thing. Um, so as soon as they get good at doing a consistent motion, I'll layer in all those dynamics. Now, if you're looking at my Google Doc, I also have um, zones, like the distance you play to and from the edge of the snare drum. Don't use zones as a dynamic level. Students love to play, try to play soft at the edge and they're like playing this high off the edge of the pad. So I associate them together. So you should play about one inch in front of the center of the pad and at 12 and nine inches. So both of those are in the center. When you get to uh, mezzo piano, you can move halfway. 
So halfway the distance from the logo. So if you're looking, I never play on the edge of the pad. So if you see this logo, if I was using this as center, I'd be, I would not play any further out than where that logo is. If the logo on your snare drum, which is like Remo or Evans, they're usually about that distance. I wouldn't go past that. I would have them play to the edge of that or maybe in the center of it. Um, so for the sake, this is on the opposite side. I would have them go from center to halfway and we'll call the logo the edge. Okay. So, and I have them do that. So you can, once they get comfortable doing all the, this up here, then I can add this to forwards and backwards. Um, so that when it comes time to a piece of meat, they see a piece of music. I'll usually tell percussionists, like, I know it says forte on the music, but because we're playing with the full band, we're going to take any time you see forte, you're going to make it mezzo forte. And every time you see mezzo forte, you're going to make mezzo piano. So I use those dynamic levels and I manipulate them in such a way that I get what I want out of the students instead of just constantly telling them to play softer. Um, a couple other things, because I know I'm running out of time and I have like a lot of other stuff I'd love to talk about, but, uh, and I know people might have questions, but when you put the drum head on the snare drum, I don't, it doesn't matter how long I've taught kids, you could put, look at a kid and say, the logo's in the wrong place play this way on the drum because that's where the snare bed, is, snare bed is and they will play on that logo. So do yourself a favor, take the head of the drum off, rotate the logo to where it is in line with the snare bed on the underneath. So students are playing to and from on the snare bed. I, I promise you it'll make your life a lot easier. Make sure, and I put, have the snare throw at where it's in closest to them and I put the logo on the opposite side. Um, I, I know that sounds trivial, but it's just like, man, it's like a gravitational pull of a black hole. Um, so align that, uh, let's see, edge, is, edge does not make, make it soft. Um, don't play directly in the center. And I would encourage um, directors like sit right on that equipment. Like I know that sounds like blasphemy, but I write on all of the timpani that I've had, I write the size of the drums next to the logo. So I'll write 32 inches, 29 inches, 26 inches, 23 inches. I'll draw a bass clef and I'll put the range of the notes that you can find online and I put those on there. Um, I'll do the same thing with the snare drum. I'll draw like potentially like a little rectangle like of the playing area. So the rectangle, this is the only like spot I'm using the build just to, like they should only play within this little spot on the on their snare drum. They shouldn't be anywhere else. Um, so draw Draw on your draw on the stuff. If if you have uh, judges giving you comments about how your equipment doesn't look pretty, but your kids make great sounds, then blame it on me. Um, so I, I write on as much stuff as you can. Like I put black sharpie dots in the center of bass drums. I make circles on tenors. I make circles on timpani playing areas. It, it's do whatever it takes so you don't have to be back there pointing at a drum saying play here. Um, you know, because we just know it doesn't work. Um, let's see. Okay, um, I'll do I'll do one other exercise, and then I'll take some questions because I know I'm running out of time. So, last thing is the eight double stops and sixteenth note exercise. Uh, we are literally doing this with the eight uh, the Eagle High School drumline right now, um, and we do it every single day. So, the exercise is this. I'll just play it real quick. So there's a bunch of variations on this, and I got to make sure I just play the variation that I wrote out for you. Um, there it is. Okay, I did a different one. So the one I just played is the one we're doing at Eagle. So the one that's on the page, I'll play one more time, is right hand for eight, left hand for eight at forte, then double stops with both hands together, and then 16th notes starting with the right hand. Now, this is something I teach in sixth grade, but it, this is, again, if your students can do this, they're gonna do much, uh, have a much higher level of achievement on an individual level. So I'll have, we'll literally play this at like 50 beats per minute for my beginners, or even like at the high school level if they can't do it well. So we're literally doing this. 
So I'm making sure the stick's rebounding because I want everything to be a legato stroke. Now, when I add both hands together, the volume shouldn't change. Most students are going to play louder here because they're using two hands together. And the same thing when they get to the 16th notes. Okay? Everything's up and everything's rebounding. So what I want to make sure is when I transition from the double stops to the 16th notes. So if I go three and four and, both sticks should be up and then I have one E. Most students will go three and four and, they will downstroke the left stick and then they will pop the stick up when the, the first stick plays. And then that, that usually creates some kind of stumble in the 16th notes. So we should be able to have the same motion, only a forte. Same motion, using just our wrist, letting the stick rebound. Same volume still, shouldn't get louder. And that left stick to lift and pause. So that left stick pauses for one sixteenth note longer, and then I have my nice relaxed sixteenth notes. And again, the sticks stop up. There's no accent. A lot of students like to put, uh, I call it an exclamation point at the end. I tell them I want a period. So just making sure the release is the exact same volume um, with all of that. So I would start that slow or even slower until every kid could do that. Most students are gonna play at fortissimo or louder. Always encourage them to play lower. Lower is better. So they think that if they hit the drum or squeeze the stick, it's magically gonna happen. So the more um, challenging material you give students, usually the louder they're going to play. So you have to always encourage them to play softer, even when it's slow. Uh, let's see. A lot of students will play 16 notes on even. What I've come to realize is the reason why students play things uneven is because they're listening, this is gonna sound weird, they're listening to their sticks instead of thinking about even 16 notes in, your, in their head. So I will literally have the class sit there and I will turn the metronome on and I will say, think one measure of 16 notes. Ready and go E and. So I will do that and they'll be like, okay, now take the volume in your head that you just sung it and I want you to turn it up as loud as it'll go while you actually play. And I want you to do it as loud as you can. And usually if they can focus more on their head, what's going on, the sound that's going on their head, it will fix most of the stuttering problems that they have with their hands. Uh, you can also have them count out loud, one E and a. So the trick usually though, is students count out loud really strong is they'll play louder. So you have to try to get them to count strong and play low. Um, but usually it's them listening to their sticks instead of listening to uh, the sound in their head. Um, and again, consistent hand motion. Your, every percussionist in your ensemble is playing rhythms poorly, most likely if they understand the rhythms because they're not having a consistent hand motion. Um, so oh, the last thing is when they're getting to the double stops, they should be able to count out loud 16th notes. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. Um, one other thing, if, if that's, if for some reason their counting isn't lining up with their sticks, I explain how, I, I always tell the kids to enunciate and over articulate like all the words. So if they're saying one E and a two E and a, I tell them when they say one, wa, the wa sound, one should be hit happening as soon as the hit, the, hits the pad or E, E, it's the beginning of the E sound and, and a. Uh. Same thing with the numbers, one, two is the T with the tip of the tongue, three, one, two, three, and four. So I get them to try to really think about articulating the words, even when they're counting out loud as a group so they can listen to the words and then trying to line the sticks up with the sounds that they're making, um, even in their head and making sure uh, that that's happening. So um, I only had about like, I don't know, a ton more pages of stuff to go through, but I, I'm kind of out of time and I wanted to see if people have questions. Um, there's tons of stuff that I wanted to talk about, but I, that was the beginning. I'm like halfway through all the things I wanted to talk about. Um, does anybody have any questions or something I might have not been very clear with? No? I know you guys have to type. Okay, yeah, I'd be more than happy to do the second half because I'd like to go through all the exercises and show 
I think the exercises that I put in the packet that I got you guys, I think are the key to like any good percussionist. Um, and I, I would definitely say this, um, this might sound like ridiculousness, but rudiments, teaching kids rudiments only will work after you do all this other stuff um, that, that I wanna get to as it relates to rhythms and dynamics. So, I, and, and I'll, the last thing I'll end with this is, everything that I'm trying to teach is, what should make every one of your percussionists successful everywhere from sixth grade to 12th grade based on band literature. I've never seen really too much band literature as playing a ton of rudiments. It's usually based on good eighth note, 16th note rhythms. Um, you won't see paradiddles in music very often or double stroke rolls. Um, so if kids can play good rhythms, and, and I was gonna get to the whole buzz roll thing, which I really wanna talk about and how that'll work. Um, but we can do that next time for sure. Great. I just want to make sure that nobody has any questions before we wrap up and then we'll for sure have, um, can come back and do this, again. or Rob, sorry, I said the wrong name. Um, Rob, come back and do this uh, second half for sure, because this was, uh, I had forgotten a lot of this and this was so helpful. So thank you so much. Oh, could you go over the note name tricks you used? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, if, if I'm correct on this, so when I taught the note names uh, on the keyboard, I'm assuming, I would teach the note names, like all the white note names by, um, so this is, I said this was outside. So this is our dog. This is the roof of the dog house. And this is the door of the dog house. So the dog, the D is for the dog house. Um, and then to the left is the cat. Um, to the left of the two is the cat. And to the right of the two is the elephant. Um, and I would say we live in a weird neighborhood. Uh, and then when you go to the main house, because it has the bigger roof, because it has the three notes, uh, we have the front door of the house. We have the garage. Um, so front door garage. I saw uh, grandma is one I see people use. Some people use apple or apple pie. And then you have um, the back door. I usually let kids sometimes pick um, names for like what food begins with an A, um, avocado, asparagus, whatever they like. And then so that would be, so cat, dog, elephant, front door, garage, apple, back door. And I would just have them keep going all the way up and then have them come all the way back because they like touching all the notes. And then I just straight up teach the note names of sharps and flats when we're doing it. Um, and teach, I teach them half steps and be like, okay, what's a half step up? And try to show them the difference between um, B and F and B and C. So other questions? Was that, or I guess the better question is, was that the answer you were looking for? Brenda. Okay, sweet. Any other questions? Well, well if, if it is, uh, the one other thing I was going to add is um, I put on the very end of the Google Doc, if anybody's looking for help with anything, like I'm going to be around for, I have no idea how long. <laughs> so I'm kind of staying at my sister's house out here in Eagle. So if your programs need help with anything, like I, I, I can kind of do it all. And I'm not trying to sound arrogant, but like I've, I've done a lot. So like instrument repairs, help with electronics, replacing like what's the right kind of equipment. I, um, I'm helping Josh borrow out at star, um, star middle school with um, especially with all this hybrid learning stuff with how to get something set up so his kids can practice at home or also how to incorporate some percussion studies along with their warm-up exercises um, so if there's anything you think of percussion wise that you might need help with um, you can hit me up my email address you can email me at percussionology at gmail.com and uh, yeah I'm more than happy to help however can and if you just want to go go for a hang and talk about all things band and percussion, I'm down for that too. All right, thank you so much. This was really great. And thanks everyone for participating. And um, Rob, I will contact you to do part two. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. So thank you everybody. and. Uh, Best of luck with all things online and <laughs> electronic troubleshooting. So <laughs> thank you guys.
was really great. There were a couple comments about uh, how it was such a great visual and having those two cameras. Oh, well, good. I'm glad. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, <laughs> I never know how long this stuff's going to go. So, and I, can, I know I can be long winded sometimes, but um, yeah, but I'd love to. You but, put so much though in, and it, the demonstrations were really good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I want to get through the rest of that stuff. So if we can find some dates, that'd be great. And if anybody has any questions, like don't hesitate to like shove them my way. I, I just want to help however I can. And I know that uh, I know that there's uh, I've been told that there's a, a lot of need for percussion out here. So I, I'll help however I can. Yeah. And you're going to get a, you'll get a lot of um, requests from like the larger districts who do the marching band competitions for sure. Um, mm -hmm those smaller rural areas are going to get a ton of, um, uh, I can't think of the right word because it's eight, <laughs> it's eight o'clock. Okay. Um, they're going to get a ton of value from having this video and not being able to, you know, come down to the larger area and get those professional development opportunities. So I, yeah, so definitely, I think what I'll do is um, tomorrow when I get it all up and running, I'll send you a quick email with a few dates and we can go back and forth on what will work. Yeah, that's great. And if, we, uh, and if other people want to do other things outside of this, because the one thing I was trying to think about doing too, and it was something TJ and I were going to work on is like summer seminars. If there's like, if we want to get, if there wants to be an in-person like band director thing instead of like, because I, I just want, I want to help people, like show them like how to fix that stuff. So um, maybe there's a date that we can do that. Or if you're, I'm, I'd be interested in picking your brain too and seeing what you think would be most appropriate. You know what? Let me get you, give you, a blah. let me get you in touch with our president who's at um, ISU, who's, mm -hmm. who's gathering all of this material and kind of wanting to do, um, I think in February, if we can't do in person, um, and they may push it to the summer, like you said, but kind of bringing everybody back who had done these professional virtual opportunities and then coming mm -hmm. together and looking at the resources that have been gathered from it. And so um, I'll forward, I'll get you two in touch for sure. And cause he'll definitely want to reach out to you if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, because I know the IMEA are always looking for um, people that are willing to help and 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 demonstrate and all that stuff. And and clinician, we're always looking for clinicians. Yeah, yeah. I'm but, I'm um, I'm down for whatever. So, but I really appreciate the opportunity, and I hope that uh, I hope it continues to go smoothly, and I hope all the things that you're doing go smoothly as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And just I think it's just that time of of. Uh, night and having to listen to all those legislatures. <laughs> Legislat oh, I, I, like I think back as a school would be starting where I'm at and I just always remember how exhausting the first week of school is. So right, right, I get right, it. right. So yeah, well, best well, of luck. Yeah, and fantastic job again and I'll email you tomorrow. Okay, thanks okay. Rebecca. You have a great evening. Okay? Yeah, you, you too, take care. Bye.